So this next topic, it's one of ethics, it's one of editorial decision making. How and when do you use the photos of children accused of crimes so heinous that prosecutors charge them as adults? Here's a portion of a report that aired on CNN. Two 12-year-old girls are accused of inviting their friend to play hide-and-seek after a sleepover. But police say they had much darker intentions. Once there, one suspect held the victim down while the other suspect stabbed her 19 times in the arms, legs, and torso. Suspects Morgan Geyser and Anissa Weir, middle school students who appeared in court Monday, allegedly spent months planning the attack on their friend. So in that clip, you heard the names of the two children who have been charged in this. Um, our viewers on television or on the internet are also able to see what their pictures look like from that first court appearance. But there's been a lot of debate among journalists, even most recently quite lively in one of our alumni Facebook groups that has gone on in the past 24 hours about whether or not we should be naming them because they are so young. I worked for news organizations where there was typically a standard that if the courts had determined that some, if, if police or courts had released a name and they had determined that a child, a juvenile would be mm -hmm. tried as an adult, that we would use that name on the air. Uh, for myself personally, as a journalist, I, and, and as a parent, I, I can't agree with that same standard. There's still a standard of innocent until proven guilty. We don't know what their mental state was. And just because they've been charged as an adult, I, I, I can't see that we then, um, they'll be known in their own community. But being known in your own community versus being known throughout the world and known on the internet is a very different story. They, they will never have private lives ever again. Well, and I think uh, part of that is the heinous you know, nature of the crime. I mean, when you, when you stab a, another yeah. preteen 19 times, you know, uh, th that's one standard mm -hmm. is, is the type of crime committed. And, and, you know, this all becomes this sense of, you know, we discuss these in our newsrooms and say, okay, what are the circumstances by which we protect or don't protect. I think the other thing is, you know, sometimes we, I think we hold ourselves to a standard when frankly, uh, children had much less exposure to media than they do now with uh, much greater supervision, whether it be parental supervision or whether it be the state of the media that didn't allow them the access that they have now. The interesting thing about kids today, and Linda, you're, you're a parent of, yeah. a, of a teenager. I'm a, of a teenager um, who just turned a teenager. The exposure that my kids have now and the things that they know about it, the age at which they know about them. And this is everything from anything that you could try to protect your kids from. It is so much greater now. They have such quick access to it. Many of them have mobile devices. And so to, to bring that back around, I think when we talk about children committing crimes, there was a time when we thought, well, they're innocent, so we should protect them because maybe they did. Now, I think we have to evaluate those standards and say, because of the exposure that they have now, uh, does that change our evaluation of their suitability to be tried as an adult, to be to be protected and all these other, you know, mm -hmm. sort of traditional arguments we've had? Now, one of the things that was interesting, um, the local media, this happened in suburban Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And from what I noticed in researching the stories, it was really coming together yesterday. Most, if not all of the local media named and showed mm -hmm. the images some of the other network affiliates, newspapers in other markets, including here, um, showed video that maybe didn't mention the names or had the faces blurred out. How does proximity play into this as well? Well, one of our traditional news values is um, the closer something is to, to home, um, the more newsworthy it is, the more information that you need to know. So if two hikers are killed in Vermont um, in some set of circumstances that makes it particularly unusual, our local audience geographically don't necessarily care about the names, but they're more interested in the story because of this thing, this odd or unusual thing that happened. Um, in this case, these names will probably stick in people's minds. Yeah, and I think, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, a novelty is another one of one of those standards. <laughs> right. and, and and in this case, you know, and not 
not novelty to make light of, but novelty because it is so strange and, and so bizarre and heinous. It stands out as a story. And because of that, it also rises in a level of importance. And it strips away, again, some of those produ- protections that I think journalists apply to a child. So I wasn't yet living here in 2009 when Alyssa Bustamante was accused and then convicted of killing nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton. How might these decisions have been made or different? I mean, everybody here in this market and in parts of the country know and could identify Alyssa Bustamante. She was 15 at the time. Um, There was some discussion in this Facebook group that there's a big difference between 15 and 12 and that somebody might not show the pictures of somebody who was 12 but would who was 15. How does that factor in? You know, I, I think they become artificial lines in the sand. At least they do mm-hmm. for me personally. And I and I do believe that it ultimately these are um, decisions that are made by individual journalists and by individual organizations and that there probably isn't going to be any sort of univer- universal agreement. That being said, 15, 12, a 12-year-old in, in one setting is, is every bit as worldly and aware as a 16-year-old in another. So I think you have to look situationally at it. 